See, what I was going to say was that, and where does that put me when you conclude the uh, IBM research people? Oh, for example. And he's got, uh, well, he's got, among other things, the 96 Eckert Morkley Award, and he's got the, the ACM Outstanding Educator Award in 2000, and numerous other awards. So I just, <laughs> but the, but you the left out the two most important ones. Which, which one? Friend of Phil Emma <laughs> and student of Ed Davidson. Oh, right? oh there you go. Okay. And uh, so we've had tight collaboration with Yale, and he's got this very clear way of explaining things, usually through allegories and things like that. And we've also had a lot of fun ribbing each other. So at that conference you were mentioning where we gave back-to-back -back talks, when I came off the stage, the conference chairman <coughs> gave me a bottle of wine. So I, I said, well, did you give one to Yale Pat? He said, yeah. So <clears throat> later in the day when we were sitting around at happy hour, I broached this with Yale, and I said, did you notice anything funny about the gift they gave you? And he said, no. And I said, well, the case of wine they gave me was open, and a bottle was missing. minutes left for my talk. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so my process of performance phase two, harness the transformation hierarchy. Do we have one of these things that you can uh, clip for? Do I push the, uh, no, I know how to do this, forward and backward, but uh, everybody these days has one of these things where you can stand over here and click forward, I, backward. I, I no, okay, it. no, I don't, no, sit down, sit down. <laughs> Let's not waste the time. I can, I can, uh, I can hit them. And uh, the other thing about power, so I, some of you heard me talk before, and if I get through two transparencies, I'm doing good. Uh, and questions at any time, which is part of the reason we don't usually get through that more than two. <laughs> Although PowerPoint seen, I've done that since, so I started doing PowerPoint uh, at the beginning of this summer. And uh, there are two phenomena, two phenomena that I have noticed. One is that there's a tendency to do far more slides. And then the second talk, I just changed, I, you know, the last, whatever the last thing was, and replaced with IBM research and changed the date. And I've got the next, I, you know, massage a couple of slides. And I've got the next talk, add a few. And so it started out as a talk with 10, becomes 12 and 15. And today, I think there's like 18. Uh, but we don't have to get through all of them. And we got to quit at, what, 11.30 or something or other? Yeah. So who knows how many we'll get through. And the other thing is people tend to be a little more reluctant to ask questions when they see there's a presentation he wants to go through. I really don't care if I go through it at all, uh, all of it or not. So if you have questions, please uh, interrupt. Uh, this talk, I was told not to give this talk. This is a modification of a talk I gave two weeks ago. I was told that, nah, these people aren't going to appreciate it. But in the last two weeks, I think I know more now than I did two weeks ago, so maybe it'll be better. And second of all, I had occasion to uh, uh, go to Washington for this meeting where they wanted to know, what do we do with terascale integration? And they've got it screwed up there, so I added a couple of slides there. So it's not the same talk as two weeks ago. The, uh, the point is, this is the transformation hierarchy, and I guess I made up this slide. It's almost 30 years ago now. And I keep seeing it in lots of other places. It reflects the fact that to get processing done, it's really the electrons down at the bottom that do the processing. Everything else above is just virtual in some sense. Uh, and if we could only speak electron, we wouldn't need all these uh, local transformations. We could do a global optimum from going up to the computer and say, hey, electron, do this thing, and then the electron would do it. We'd be all done. Unfortunately, we can't speak electron. They can't speak. Uh, English, which is the only language I know, and so we're reduced to going through these layers. And uh, this has been going on now for a very long time. The algorithms, people work at the algorithms layer and microarchitects with microarchitect layer and circuits people. In fact, there was a talk by a professor at one of the Ivy League schools at the University of Texas a couple weeks ago, and this professor is supposedly collaborating with the architects. But this professor is a circus person. 
and somebody in the in the in the room asked a question, a very Mickey Mouse question about architecture, and the professor didn't have a clue. He said, oh, that's their problem. So, even though we claim to be collaborating, uh, people work at just their layer, and uh, so to give you the uh, there's two things I want to you know walk away from this talk, and the first one is that. Uh, this business of having these uh, fixed layers is uh, that's phase one, and we're now in phase two, and we can no longer tolerate everybody working at their own uh, layer. So until recently, phase one, we maintain the artificial walls. You work within your layer. Uh, people like it because the abstractions are secure. You know, everybody knows. You know, you abstractions are good. You know, they're terrific if you don't care about performance and if you can be guaranteed everything below you uh, works properly. In fact, I was delighted that you guys, I don't know whether all, all of you know this or not, but there's a, there's a chip that came out of IBM called the cell processor. I don't know how many of you are aware of it or not, but uh, one of the hallmarks of the cell processor is that you program this thing at its low level. And of course, the industry, uh, how can you program at its low level? And the statement is made, which I love it. I don't know whether it's Hofstede or Cayley, or maybe you're instructing them these days. But the comment was, if you really care about performance, you really have to know what the hell's going on underneath, which I've been saying for years. My hero in this business of computing, by the way, is Donald Knuth, you know, which, spoke, which I guess proves, A, I'm old, <laughs> you know, and B, I haven't learned better yet. But Knuth, when he teaches data structures, in fact, volume one, you know, of uh, the art of computer programming, is data structures, and what does he do with these data structures? You know, they're, they're, he actually shows how they're represented in memory. And the algorithm is assembly language, and he makes a statement, well, if you do not know how these uh, data structures are actually stored in memory, and what the algorithm actually goes to, then you're forever going to be writing inefficient algorithms. But most of the industries, uh, so, in fact, most of the industry doesn't know what an algorithm is, but for those that do, getting down to the level of how this stuff is actually stored in memory uh, is totally beyond them. In fact, uh, if you ask a computer science graduate these days, uh, sorting, you know about sorting, because oh, they know about sorting. They can rattle off 10 different sorting algorithms. Then you say, does it matter whether all the data to be sorted can be put in memory at the same time, or whether you have to go to back and forth to the disk, and they don't have any clue. Well, no, I guess not, you know, just so long as the data is in this thing called memory system. Well, wrong. In fact, today, with the size of L2 caches, uh, whether it can all fit in the L2 cache uh, matters. Uh, but we're still turning out people at this layer where they don't know anything below, and it provides for a better comfort zone. Most of the work we've done to improve the... Can I go backwards? I can. Yes? <laughs> yes. So most of the improvement of all these more and more transistors you know, today we're over a billion transistors on a chip. That's not the bottom. And the frequencies now are approaching 4 gigahertz. And it's not going to be long before we have 10 billion. And a few years from now, it'll be 100 billion transistors on a chip. And 10 gigahertz is just around the corner. So there's all this stuff. And up to now, most of it has been in improving the microarchitecture. Uh, pipelining, caches, branch prediction, blah, 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 blah. Today, we have too many transistors to continue to uh, do that. Therefore, we do CMP. Right? See, in the, up to recently, all these things, well, we can handle it. You know, we kind of understand these things, uh, pipelining, caches, et cetera. But now, there's so many transistors that designing these individual structures, you just, just you, know, you guys know this probably better than me, as he pointed out. It, I'm in academia, so uh, do we use the transistors wisely? So commercial chips in the last few years uh, poorly utilize the area, you know, large L2 caches. There's another chip that you guys make, maybe some of you are aware of it, called the, uh, the Power 5 or the Power 6. And if you look at the chip, uh, what's that thing that's occupying more than half the chip, you know, the L2 cache? And it starts paying its dues. Most of the transistors in the L2 cache in any given cycle are sitting there doing nothing. You know, is there a better way? You know, one of the good things that came out of Danny Hillis' thesis on the connection machine and 
the mid 80s was he says, why is it that humans do so much better at processing than computers do? You know, if you figure the switching time of the transistor and the switching time of the neuron, and the number of transistors and the number of neurons, uh, you multiply these things. So what do you got? You got 10 to the 10 neurons. You got 10 to the 9 transistors. And you got uh, millisecond, 10 to the 3 switching events per second in transistors. You've got, I'm oh, sorry, in uh, neurons. You've got 10 to the 9 switches per second in humans. So for humans, it's 10 to the 9, 10 times to the 9, 10 to the 18th for but for computers, it's 10 to the 9 times 10 to the 9 is 10 to the 18. For humans, it's 10 to the 10 times 10 cubed is 10 to the 13. So humans have five orders of uh, magnitude less ability than the computer is. And yet, if you're driving in Times Square, the human can pick out the red light and the computer doesn't stand a chance. Why is it? And his answer is because the computer, even though it has 10 to the 9 transistors and the potential of 10 to the 9 switches, of each, each cycle, uh, each, each second, it doesn't really uh, do, uh, each cycle, it really doesn't do that, right? Uh, whereas humans, all your neurons are working all the time. Now, they're not all firing every cycle, otherwise you, you don't have an epileptic fit, but they're processing either firing or below the threshold, etc. So I, I would insist that that example today there's the L2 cache. You look at the chip, the big L2 cache. Well, what happens when we get 10 billion uh, transistors on a chip? We're going to have a huge L2 cache, say. Why? Because it's easy. And what the result is, is that bullet unwarranted accusation that they say, you know, computer architecture is dead. Uh, we get all these more transistors coming in. And uh, uh, the benefit in performance is very small. So we double the number of transistors and we get a small percent improvement in performance. Therefore, our computer architecture is, you know, not meaningful anymore. See, because the performance is not tracking the number of transistors that we're providing to it. Uh, diminishing returns. I would argue that it's not the fault of the transistors, it's the fault of the people that are doing designing and we're just taking this, this cop out. We have more transistors so we just make a larger out of cash. And of course, uh, the recent flurry of so everybody's doing CMPs these days, you know. So they have what? They have uh, a dual core and now quad core, and uh, next week it's octa core. Uh, and uh, so deja vu 1982, the first time uh, you were still a student back then. You remember these, uh, the non Vaughn and the connection machine and the Boolean vector machine, everybody was gaga. Uh, over how many processes can I put on the chip? So we're back to that again. Uh, why are we doing CMPs? Very simple, very simple reason. I got a billion transistors on a chip. Okay. How the hell do I design a processor with a billion transistors? Well, I can do that, or I can say, ah, I remember in the second grade, I learned division. Okay. And if a Pentium 4 takes 50 million, and I got a billion, 50 million goes into a billion 20 times. Ha! Ah, boom, 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 You know, and I'm problem solved. Problem's not solved, but I end up with a chip, and one process is working, the other 19 is sitting there twiddling their thumbs, probably. I've kicked it up to the software, because we complain, you know, software. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, I would argue that we haven't designed an effective chip. And so now, in this last bullet, this last part was added since... Uh, uh, my meeting in Washington, which was on terascale integration, which is the latest uh, buzzword. You guys probably would rather sit than stand. I tend to get boring, and if you're standing, you're likely to fall asleep, but then you're going to fall and hurt yourself, so you're better off. You know, <laughs> uh, so why won't terascale allow it? Bandwidth, there are too many cores. Uh, you just can't feed the cores, and if the core can't get instructions and data in, it's just going to uh, but there is a project, which I don't want to mention, but they, uh, they claim there's no problem with bandwidth. And they've got data to prove it. You know. So how do you do multiple cores on the chip and have no problem with bandwidth? Put in a big L2 cache. <laughs> <laughs> so when the number of transistors is infinite, that won't work. See? Once we get to an infinite number of transistors in the cache, you're absolutely right. On the chip, you're absolutely right. A big L2 cache. 
the whole memory space. But until then, you're going to have to go off chip. So they're very sound made. So you, you, well, you're now, you're a manager these days, right? Yeah. Uh, very simple answer. In fact, during my Berkeley period, Gordon Bell came and gave a talk. He was at Encore that time, and he had 32 processors and a Snoopy bus. No, he didn't. He didn't have a Snoopy bus. He had a, he had a write-through bus. He had 32 processors. So 32 processors, bus, memory, and they were right through caches. And I said, Gordon, <laughs> you know, he says, Yale, if you run the processes slow enough, <laughs> and that's what they've done. They run the, they run the, they run the course slow enough, and they have a sophisticated I.O. subsystem, and so uh, there's no problem with feeding uh, the core. But we don't want to uh, cheat that way, I hope. So bandwidth, too many cores, power energy, too many transistors. Uh, so what do we do? And this bullet was for their benefit because I kept hearing terascale means massive replication. And the, the, the statement of that workshop was terascale integration. And I want to make emphasize that massive integration is not necessarily massive replication. So the answer is break through the layers, the obvious answer. And we've already done this in limited cases between the compiler and the microarchitecture. That's what predication is all about. I don't need to explain that to you. Uh, the uh, Intel, uh, the x86, uh, allows, you should get 100% branch prediction on for loops because the x86 has this uh, CX register, ECX, I guess you call it now. And so the code will load up the uh, ECX register with the count which you don't know at compile time, but you sure as hell know at runtime. And so the compiler generates the code saying, load the CX register with the count. And then you keep going through the loop, decrementing the count. And when the count goes to zero, you fall through. And so no branch prediction is uh, necessary. So there are a couple of examples of uh, places where the compiler and the microarchitecture can work together. Uh, but there are other ways we can do it. Pragmas in the language. Why does everybody say that's bad, you know? Shame on the programmer for letting the compiler know this insight <laughs> that the compiler could use to generate code that might actually uh, uh, do better. Uh, you've heard my refrigerator, refrigerator example? Anybody not heard my? Who hasn't heard my refrigerator example? Oh, really? Ah, audience. <laughs> Good. So the refrigerator, for those that have heard it before, you'll just have to suffer. Point, how many times have you heard about the refrigerator? 10, 20, well, more than two dozen. More than two dozen, <laughs> right. But look at all these people that have, right? So I believe that when we get a 10 billion, 100 billion chances on a chip, there's room for lots of refrigerators. Now, what is a refrigerator? A refrigerator is actually not a thing, it's a person. Uh, how many football fans we got in the room? So who knows who the refrigerator is? William Perry. William Perry, who do you play for? Chicago Bears. Chicago Bears, offense or defense? Uh, Defense. He was a defensive tackle. And for those that are unenlightened, William Perry was huge. And he was strong. And he was a defensive tackle, a defensive lineman. Bust through the line. Now, this is... I'm sorry? Is that guy who took steroids? No. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> Yeah, by today's standard, it's actually not big anymore. Not big. 325, 330 pounds. Yeah, by today's standard, it's not. But uh, don't get me down the steroids track, because then we'll never have time for the talk at all. I have a lot to say about that, including a lot to say about our current administration in Washington. But if I get on that one, I'll never get that. The more What happened? Oh, the okay. Yeah. Uh, so William Perry played defense. You have to understand the American game of football. For those that don't, and maybe some of you for, from the, uh, overseas where they play, or, or south of the border where they play a different game of football, this is America. And what makes America strong is uh, labor unions. And so the football players only, in this country only have, get to play, have to play half the game. See? They don't play the whole game like they do in the European game of football. And so when the offense is on the field, the defense is on the bench. And the offense tries to move the, the football past this line to score, and the defense tries to keep them from moving past that line. And so William Perry, a defensive player, is on the bench when the offense is on the field. 
Now, the reason why he started to give me, you know, hesitate about his answer was that he knows that if the Bears are on the one foot line, okay, one foot, they bring in William Perry, okay, if, if the Bears are on the five yard line, <coughs> then there's no way. But on the one foot line, they bring in William Perry, <coughs> take him off the bench, power him up, which is a critical notion here, bring him into the huddle. Hand him the ball, point him in the direction of the goal line. He's only got this far to go, and give him the ball, and, uh, uh, and he scores. <coughs> Ref goes six points for the Bears, and he's got half of the defensive team hanging off of him. Five yards, he'd never make it. Say. <laughs> so the point is that when the offense is on the field for 99.99% of the game, William Perry's sitting on the bench, powered off, not consuming leakage current. But when you need him, you really need him. And so for that little unit of time, you power them up, you bring them in, you hit them the ball, the Bears score. What I'm suggesting is that with 10 billion or 100 billion chances on chip, there's room for lots of William Perry, lots of refrigerators, lots of functionality that do a specific thing, but when you need it, you want to do it quickly. In fact, even one of the first Mickey Mouse chips, you know, these wrist chips that came out in the, you know, that hiccup that... Uh, Started, in fact, uh, don't ever confuse risk with what John Cock did, see. <laughs> this risk mentality, which got it wrong, was not. What John Cock said was expose the lowest level of control to the compiler. That's not what this risk mentality was doing. They were doing simple, you know, an instruction can't do more than just one little, one cycle of uh, and it's one piece of work. John was not saying that. He was saying, look at what the control signals look like and compile to them. Uh, it was a much more Mickey Mouse thing than what John had envisioned back in the 70s when he put forward that idea. Uh, so, uh, and risk was an, you know, John didn't come up with the acronym or the, the silliness. In any case, uh, one of the first risk chips was the AMD 29000. And one of the instructions in that ISA was find first. So you get a bit vector, and you want to find the first bit in the vector that's set. Try to do that in software. Well, you got a loop, you know, the bit. Is it set? No, okay. You know, and then finally you find the bit that's set. Try to do it in hardware. Any sophomore knows about priority encoders, and that's an assignment we give in the logic design course. It doesn't take that many transistors. And AMD said, this is, a, this is a, uh, an operation, a function that we need done very fast. With a priority encoder, it's a fraction of a cycle. In software, it's tens of cycles. Stick it in the ISA. Right? So even back in the 80s, the architects of AMD recognized the fact that <clears throat> if you can get a piece of functionality done quickly and you need it, you don't have to need it all the time. In fact, there's a sort of an inverse ratio. The, the bigger it is, uh, the, the less often you may need it and still want to put it. You know, Intel had this thing called the 8086. And how'd they do on floating point code, the 8086? They didn't. They didn't, exactly. Then 87. And then 286. And 287. And 386. And 387. And 486. And then what? 486 was a million transistors, one million. And that was enough to take the 40 point unit and put it right on the chip. What I'm suggesting is all one million transistors and they were able to put the 40 point processor on the chip. Now we're already up to a billion or over a billion. I guess the biggest chip right now that I know of is 1.72 billion and, and, and counting. And so how does a million go into a billion? A thousand times, right? A thousand millions is a billion. So you could. There's a lot of area there if we can power it off and keep it powered off except when we need it. But to make use of it, we need the higher level knowing what to put on the chip and how to use it. And that's sort of the message there. That's the refrigerator. So what I would argue is the future chip is X plus superscalar, and X is whatever piece of functionality you want to do. So one of these big deal companies in Texas they do DSP chips, and they call me, uh, we want you to consult for us on the next DSP chip. You know, I say, DSP. I can't even spell DSP. <laughs> so, 
You know how many times I have given that line and got no reaction? <laughs> but now I'm in your town, see? So it's a pleasure. It's amazing. You know, I deliver the line. We can't they sit the there. They don't get it, you know? <laughs> but I give it here and I get great, you know? So they say, no, it's not the digital signal processing we care about. It's all this other stuff, you know, which gets lumped as superscalar. That's what I think the, uh, the future is. Uh, the algorithm, the compiler, the microarchitecture, all working together. I, 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 the book, there's a 2164. Dick Seitz did the 21064, first alpha chip. And then uh, uh, next chip, uh, 21064 was a two-wide issue uh, in order processing, very simple for a branch predictor. In fact, the branch predictor was last time taken. Uh, and then came the 21164, where they went to a saturating two-bit counter for the branch predictor, and it was four wide issue, it was still in order. Uh, four instructions could be brought in each cycle. They retired one every four cycles. Four times four is 16. The chip was running at 6% of what it could. How come? So Dick looked at a whole bunch of code and programs running and said, you know what the problem is? What you do, you get this large cache line. You know, you're trailing edge effects. You get this large cache line, and most of the time that chip is doing this, waiting for a cache refill. So you bring in a cache line, you use 10% of it, and then you do a cache miss and bring in another cache line. We throw this away. And what if the algorithm, the compiler, the microarchitecture, maybe we need to make smaller cache lines. Maybe we need the compiler of the, probably the algorithm layer, to package the code and data better. Uh, if we open it up and say, okay, what are we going to do? Do the, do the algorithm people even know there's a thing like a cache line? I would argue most algorithm people don't. Now, you say, I, ah, you know what I'm No, I know what I'm talking about. Most algorithm people don't know what a cache line is. So working together, breaking uh, the layers. And so that does, I come up with a bunch of examples of how the compiler and the microarchitecture, the algorithm and the compiler and the microarchitecture, the microarchitecture and circuits. For example, uh, you know, we're getting to the point now where uh, you know, I get pushback from the uh, ver verification people say, why do you keep coming up with things to make this chip more complicated? We can't even verify the chip as it is today. Maybe the problem is that we need to design in, you know, LSSD taken to generation, multiple generations, you know. So I'm on to it. That's a job for you. Figure out what we need to do in the microarchitecture to make the circuits verifiable, for example. Uh, internal fault tolerance, uh, you know, we're running at, I don't have to tell you guys this, you know, we're running at frequencies now that, uh, you know, alpha particles. So how do we deal with that? Well, maybe we have to do the logic design taking that into account. The point is that by working at the different layers, by having uh, awareness of the other layers and talking to these people, maybe we can make a difference downstream. And, of course, there are problems. Computer people, you know, they like to work within their layers. Very few understand outside their layer. And then, if I have multiple cores on the chip, you know, people just, uh, they don't think in parallel. Everybody thinks sequentially. So those are the problems. Yeah, but isn't that part of the human psyche? Well, I don't know. So that's a good question. Because fundamentally, that our whole structure of logic mathematics and everything we do is inherently sequential and we look for parallelism. And you know the old story about making nine women pregnant so you can produce a baby in one month, you know, it doesn't work. I mean, it's sequential. <laughs> the thought police may be uh, paying attention. I am delighted that you came up with that example, because I usually have to be the one to do it. Now I'm yeah, free from the... <laughs> Does anybody know Phil's vampire story, by the way? <laughs> Who knows Phil's vampire story? Who doesn't know? No, no, so, so most of you don't know Phil's vampire story. So Phil wrote a paper, and uh, I guess it was about branch prediction or something. It was a complex CPI. Is that what it was? That's what you wanted. It. So anyway, you know, you know the difference between CPI and IPC. I don't have to explain that one to you. Uh, Phil is absolutely right. CPI is the correct thing to look at rather than IPC. 
IPC is counterintuitive. It doesn't help you. It's a marketing tool. CPI, they're really the same thing, right? Just one's the inverse of the other. But if you think IPC, it doesn't help you do better. If you think CPI, CPI is a sum of all the contributions. And if you look at CPI and then you look at the contributions, you can see where should you put your energy into improving. And so you can get a better CPI. Phil's absolutely right. Thinking in terms of CPI is the right way to go. And, uh, but you, know, you and I are probably the only two people that still uh, push that, unfortunately, because it is uh, the right way to go. Anyway, so Phil was writing up a paper making the point. And it was 4 o'clock in the morning. And so he said, uh, so he writes down, he says, 4 o'clock in the morning, so I thought I would call Yale Pat, you know. And everybody knows that Yale Pat is a vampire, and so he's up working at 4 o'clock in the morning. And so I knew that I'd get him in. And indeed, I called him, and he was in. And, uh, you know, wrote up the paper and submitted it for publication. And uh, IBM wasn't going to publish the paper. <laughs> they said, you know, he, Yale may be offended, you know, and he'll sue. <laughs> so they made you take it out of the paper. Yeah. yeah. yeah and then Phil, it. yeah, so then Phil came up to me and said, what would you think if I put that in the paper? I said, I think it would be cool. It would be great. I mean, that paper I would circle and show everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Phil said, that's what I told the lawyers. But they, <laughs> so anyway, uh, we'll get back to what you said. So this was the title of my slides, so and I'm ready for my talk. Um, uh, phase two, okay? and what he says, you know, is a good lead-in, see? It's all about education. People think sequentially, is that right? There are two problems with these people. So you remember a couple <laughs> of moments ago, it's about people, right? People work within their layers, nobody understands outside their layer. <laughs> People think sequential, two problems. First problem is abstraction, which I already talked about a moment ago, is uh, misunderstood. And I already talked about that. I've got several uh, bullets. Supposing uh, I uh, want to take a taxi to the airport. And, uh, you know, I'm flying out of Westchester County Airport, you know. And uh, so I go get a cab, and uh, he takes me to the airport, and I say, wow. Tappan Zee Bridge, that's kind of, and uh, he says, oh, yeah, we always go across the Tappan Zee Bridge, and then we come down and come across the George Washington Bridge, and you can get to the Westchester Airport, County Airport from here by going over Tappan Zee and then going down and then coming back over the George Washington Bridge, right? And that may be, in fact, ah, I can give you my real example. I was in the financial district of uh, Manhattan, and I had a flight out of LaGuardia, and the cab starts taking me up the east side highway to go over the Tribor Bridge. And as we pass these, you know, the Mid, uh, Midtown Tunnel and then the, what's the 59th Street Bridge, and I say, well, you know, where are we going? He says, oh, best way to go, Tribor Bridge. And so the fear is absurd, and I almost missed my flight. It is. It is the better way to go. <laughs> it is the better way to go? <laughs> <laughs> From the financial district of LaGuardia, you go over the Tribor? Well, you have to go to the North Shore, no. and in terms of time. No, no, the way you go, you take it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 you can stop in there. That's the only thing. You've got to change that example. We can all collect a few more than all. So I, I actually <laughs> took his number and wrote to the New York City taxi <laughs> and they sent me a check for, I don't know, 20 bucks or something, which would have been the difference between going across the Midtown Tunnel and going up. I cannot believe you guys are right that it's better to go, it's better to go this. You'll be drunk in Midtown Tunnel. No, this is a drunk. This is like, what, 11 o'clock in the morning or something or other. It was not a rush hour kind of thing. And I've gone through the tunnel with non-rush hour, and it's not that bad. Anyway, the point is that if you don't know the layout of the land, take me to the airport could be a disaster. You can operate the layer of extraction as long as you know what's going on. The scheme chip. I don't know how many know this one. Um, so it was like 79 or 80 when Curva Mead uh, came up with these design rules so that any idiot can do... Uh, um, Circuit design, you know, green, red, must be a transistor. Uh, me, Conway, and then when Conway wrote it all down, they put out a book, and so people were designing VSI circuits in, uh, 
you know, meet Conway, Conway design rules. And uh, the guys at MIT did this. They decided they'll do the scheme chip. They'll do a chip that executes scheme. And it was a disaster. It didn't work. They said, wait a minute, we're MIT. We do understand how transistors work. We do know what a small signal model looks like. And so they then redesigned the chip, knowing everything that they know about transistors. And guess what? It worked. Uh, Serving, I already mentioned. Uh, Microsoft developers, guys who program in C, or, like I said, I don't do anymore, C++. And I had students, uh, Michigan students mostly, that I taught uh, uh, the freshman course from the bottom up, where they understand how the computer works. And I get email all the time from guys who are, and women who are, you know, 10 years out now as uh, developers at Microsoft writing high-level code telling me that their ability to write good code is much enhanced because they know what the hell's going on underneath. Uh, wireless network. So I would go, I was involved in this thing called uh, the ARPANET. I'm not the father of the ARPANET. You know, most of these fathers <laughs> of the ARPANET, you know, claim you know, far too much. To sell yours. By the way, you know, <laughs> who said that? <laughs> so Al Gore had a lot more to do with the uh, development of the ARPANET than most of the people who take credit for it. When the ARPANET was first put forward, which was 1967-68, uh, uh, the toughest job was getting the funding from Congress. And Al Gore understood that early on. And without him, it never would have happened. Well, I don't know. It never would have happened. But it certainly wouldn't have happened uh, when it did happen. So he had a lot to do with it. By the way, if you want to give credit to the ARPANET, Father of the ARPANET, uh, I have two people in mind, for those who care about that. Uh, and I can't decide which one. Uh, Licklider or uh, Larry Roberts. Uh, Licklider had the idea at DARPA, then went back to MIT, and Larry Roberts came to uh, DARPA and then <coughs> made it happen. Uh, these were the two uh, key guys, although there's like 10 guys who now take credit for it. Anyway, I was a kid. I was a fresh PhD, and I was on this, I was in the Army and on the feasibility team. And the point of the ARPANET right from the get-go was, you know, the, you had these peer protocols. Uh, layers, and I was delighted to learn that uh, the wireless networks now there, uh, and of course in wireless it really matters because you no longer have a cable where you can trust the carrier being modulated. You now have, you know, it's, you know, pointings vector and there's maybe a, tr a tree in the way or something or other. So you have to worry about the topology that you're buying later. But the point is to get performance of a wireless network, you have to break through these layers. So these are a few examples about abstraction. And the other problem is what you raised, is that thinking in parallel is hard, you know. Well, <laughs> <laughs> what if the programmer understood shared memory and synchronizing primitives? Would it matter? I insist it would. And that's sort of my second. So my first message today is breaking through the layers has to be done. The second message is uh, this thing, that breaking through the layers and understanding, you'll get better uh, results. And in fact, uh, to answer your question about the nine women, and et cetera, uh, what I want to do in the freshman course is come up with some uh, problems which the kids will program in parallel right from the get-go. Why can't they do it as freshmen? Uh, and by the way, freshmen, what I do in the freshman course is the first program they write is in machine language. One program. Uh, it gets old very quickly, zeros and ones, you know. In fact, uh, uh, I don't know whether you're old. You're not old enough, probably. So the ad instruction, uh, decimal machine put out by this company, and the ad instruction was 11. The multiply was 13. Today. I happen to remember that because that was, what, over 40 years ago. IBM 1620. That's before your time, yeah? yeah. 16, 20, yeah. Um, remembering and branch, unconditional branch was 49, you know, for any of you that are really old like me. Uh, the point is that gets old in a hurry. And so the second program is already in assembly language. We write some assembly language programs where they have to understand what's going on at the lower layers, and we just keep raising the level of abstraction. Uh, can we come up with program problems for them to solve in parallel? So the simple, so I've got a few examples, uh, uh, pipeline. So I've got a, a piece of code, 
and I want to stream data through it. Well, why can't I take that piece of code and have a piece and a piece and a piece and a piece, and I build a software pipeline where the, as opposed to software pipelining, a software pipeline where the, the data comes in and this piece of code works on it, then it hands it over to this piece of code and this piece of code, and I'm streaming it through. And once I fill up the pipe, I've got this thing running at a lot faster than if I uh, have the data go through all the code before it works on the next uh, piece of data. Or uh, factorial. I love factorial. So uh, how, how do you do 10 factorial? You know factorial, right? He does mathematics. So for those who don't know, factorial is 10 factorial is 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6, etc. Uh, anyway, so it would take you these uh, 8 multiplies or something to do 10 factorial. So now I got an idea. Why don't you multiply 10 times 9 times 8? And then you give me 7 factorial. Start. And then when you both give me your answers, I multiply the two results. And now I've got factorial done in half the time. It's a Mickey Mouse problem, but it gets people thinking that, you know, maybe there's a better way. Right? Or uh, searching. So, uh, you know, you do binary search. You get the midpoint. Then it's either this half or this half. Uh, what happens if I can have... Uh, Eight pieces. So I start. I in parallel I'll come up with eight midpoints, and that'll tell me which eighth to use. Now I can search in one third the time. I'm not improving on you know big O like changing it from uh, you know uh, exponential to uh, uh, to to uh, polynomial, but I'm getting the work done a lot faster by thinking in parallel. And I can have them think in parallel as freshmen, and I gotta believe that. That's going, getting that mindset different is going to make uh, a big difference. You, you should do your division example. Remember you had a new algorithm for division that you used? In a yeah, class? yeah, that came up in a, so they, you haven't seen this one. <laughs> you talk about the reducing fractions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I was at, how many of you have seen this one? Uh, so what is this, just fun and games, I guess. Right. <laughs> so I was at a... Uh, I came up with this during a uh, doctoral thesis exam, and the kid was a yo-yo, and the advisor <laughs> was defending him, and he had this thing, and I, it didn't make any sense at all to me, but his data worked. I said, well, could you explain why? You know, a dissertation, you suppose, in fact, this is your Tom Heights. You care about that. You don't get your papers accepted because the community doesn't care about that. But you guys care about it, explaining why the phenomenon works. You know? And so the kid had this, this data, and he had no idea why it worked. You know? So I, on the spur of the moment, I came up with this example, and I said, uh, do you know how to reduce fractions? See? And uh, so you, you open your mouth so I can pick on you. How would you reduce that for those fractions? Just cut the six. <laughs> You've seen me do this before, yeah. have you? It was a teacher of mine. Huh? A teacher of mine. A teacher? Who? Really? Who? Who? Oh, long time ago. A long time ago. Yeah. So I said you cancel the sixes, say. <laughs> yeah, it works. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to embarrass him now. So mine was in the classroom, say. And this was before you were my student, right? You were trying to impress me. So what does Moyne do? After class, he goes out and writes a program to find all cases for which this works. You know, and the other obvious one is 19 divided by 95, right, is one-fifth. But Moyne found things like uh, 499 divided by 998, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I was duly impressed, and in fact, Moyne and I have had a long love affair ever since. <laughs> yeah. Uh, addition, uh, so a part of the message here is to think differently, you know, that maybe there's a difference between the essence of the problem and the particular algorithm that you happen to know of. Now, you're all sitting, uh, you know, comfortably, you don't have a desk in front of you. Uh, damn it. What I would really like you to do, and I don't know how I can make you do this, uh, also, I don't know how many of you have engineers. I, usually an engineer carries a pen in his pocket. A lot of you guys don't have pens. But if you have a piece of paper in your pocket, what I'd like you to do for me, if you would indulge me, is do a couple of addition examples. And this is the first one. I'd like you to 
uh, add uh, 12 and 9 and write down the answer. So, yeah, have you done it? Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's the first one. And then I'd like you to, everybody, anybody need any more time? <laughs> <laughs> so now I want you to add these two numbers together and write down the answer. Moin, can you do that? <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead. Come on. Come on. <laughs> yeah. And uh, anybody need any more time? So you all said, okay. So uh, the answer was what, 21? And what was the answer for the second one? <laughs> so you can reverse it. Huh? Seven salt. Seven salt. Probably eight, eight seven, seven, three, two, eight, 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 seven, seven, so you didn't do it. You did it in your head. And so when you did it, see, the problem with doing it in your head was you were doing all this mumbo-jumbo in both directions, see, which is why what I really wanted you to do, but you won't indulge the old man, <laughs> is actually do it on a piece of paper. How many of you did it on paper? Okay, good. So I had half a dozen. And that's the only ones I want to vote. <laughs> so when you did it on paper and you wrote down the number 21, how many of you wrote the two before the one? Nobody? One person? The rest of you wrote the one first and then the two? Really? You wrote the one first before the two? No, I didn't write it. But I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're going to invite me to give a talk, and I'm trying to make up the you better leave it. Do what I ask. It's not talking. So now what we have to do is theoretically think of what is going on, see, you know, and you know about theory and practice, you know. So in theory, they're both the same, right? but in practice, they're all the difference in the, in the world, yeah. So the point that I wanted to make, which you guys now will not allow me to wake, I should be pissed and just leave, yeah. <laughs> is uh, I want to know how many people wrote the two down first, how many people wrote the one down first? And then how many wrote the 8 down first, and then how many wrote the 7 well, down first? And if you had gone through the exercise, and you're at all typical of audiences in the past, most people write the 2 before the 1, and most people write the 7 before the 8. And why is that? Because the first edition you were doing table lookup, and the second edition you were going through the algorithm. There's nothing inherent in addition that is one or the other. It's just, in fact, you guys did this, this machine, the 1620, which they used to call the cadet. You know, you know what cadet stood for. Can't add, doesn't even try. Because they didn't have an ALU that added. What they had were these table lookups. You want to add, uh, you know, 2 and 9, you'd go row 2, column 9, bingo, it's 11. Right? That's the way that machine worked. Uh, table lookup. And table lookup is very different than the algorithm for addition. In fact, uh, look ahead, look ahead, carry is based on the fact that it's not, you don't have to ripple the carry all the way through. <coughs> Addition is not a time-dependent uh, operation. <coughs> Addition is this plus this, boom. Now, it's not a sequential operation. It's because the common algorithm for adding large numbers is big. So that's my point, is that you take a simple thing like this, and uh, uh, there's more than one way to even do something simple like addition. If we expand the horizons, I guess I'm not going to talk about, you guys seem bored with the education part, so I'll just skip it. <laughs> uh, I can go through it if you want, but uh, I, I was told specifically that these guys don't care about what it takes to teach, so I'll just skip my education slide. It'll be on the set you have if anybody wants to go through it. Question or comment? Yeah, go ahead. Isn't there a caveat? I understand what you're saying, and I certainly agree with it, but we have something called stride and cash misses, which come up immediately in all you're talking about is parallelism, which causes the problem to go right back to the cash and the sizes, working set, and all that. If you don't include that in there somehow, you know, so you it's include the whole it. fundamental point. So you include it, and so you recompile for a different uh, uh, implementation. But you've got to include that in the education so the kids understand that. That's certainly true, but it turns out at the end of the freshman course, we don't give them a degree. We just let them go on to the sophomore course, see? <laughs> so that by the time they graduate, yes. But my insistent is it has to start at the beginning. OK, sure. No and I've given you three examples where I think it can start at the beginning, and we can change that mindset. Uh, so 
So that's my response to that. Yeah, oh yeah, by the time they graduate, they certainly will know all this stuff. But if we start them thinking parallel instead of thinking sequential until then it's too late, uh, then I think we have a problem on our hands. And then we say what, what you say, you know, about the, about the nine uh, women. Uh, and so we have an education problem. And the problem is, and you probably see it here to some extent, but outside here, it's an enormous extent. Too many computer professor, professionals don't get it. They can't uh, span these uh, layers. I would say we have an opportunity. Applications can drive microarchitecture if we can speak the same language. If we really do develop in the, your people you hire and that you work with a broader uh, spectrum of what they understand. We have thousands of cores. We're going to have thousands of cores. We don't have them today, but this transistor thing is growing and it's no longer, as I hope I pointed out, uh, possible to continue business as usual. Uh, we have to be able to power on and off under program control. And the algorithms and compiler microarchitecture circuits all talking to each other, then maybe we have a, a half a chance. And uh, so this last bullet was added for this thing I did in Washington last week on terror scale integration. And once again, I made that point. So I'm back to my first slide of the transformation hierarchy. And the future, if there is a future, is having, I got problems and I got electrons and everything in between is up for grabs. And the more interaction between those layers, the better chance we have of going. Uh, I added on a few, uh, a few uh, bullets. They, for this workshop I did, uh, they um, asked us up front to respond to a few questions that they had. So I thought I would uh, share with you uh, their questions and my responses just for, uh, for two things. One, my, uh, you can see my, uh, ir uh, my uh, irreligious, my sacrilegious, uh, my heretical nature. Uh, more importantly, the kinds of questions they were asking. Yeah, well, with, uh, with terascale integration, do we need a new architecture, or can we iterate the current architecture, architectures? And I said, what is entirely new? Uh, so we'll do uh, you know, entirely new. Uh, if we go back far enough, most of these ideas have been proposed before. So uh, back to the future in some place. Well, actually, this, <coughs> this bridges to something I wanted to ask before. That once you're successful and you develop a legacy, then how do you evolve that forward? Yeah, so uh, uh, I've never understood why Intel. So let's take just something simple like, uh, you know, Pentium 4 or something. Which, no, it's a Pentium M. So today's Pentium M, by the way, is 140 million transistors. Uh, you know how big the L2 cache is? 110 million. And then, you know, clearly the properly designed. The point is that there's a lot here, right? And so, in fact, there is a bullet back when I talked about the compiler and the microarchitecture working together, and I've never understood why uh, Intel doesn't do that. 140 million transistors. And back in the later part of the 80s, they had this thing called the 486, which was 1 million transistors. So why don't they do this? And as the program comes in, if it's legacy code, you send it there. And if it's not legacy code, you, set, you use the rest of the chip. And so you deal with the legacy, but you don't waste a lot of the chip area. In fact, uh, I had another idea, which I was trying to get those guys to do, which is uh, the spiral, spiral approach to um, uh, microprocessor design. See, So you have a chip. And then uh, a couple of generations, a couple of shrinks. And now that chip uh, can fit in uh, one fourth. And so you just do that. And then your new generation is up here. And then a few more years go by, and now all of this, you know, so uh, this part goes here, and this part goes here. And you still have this. And, you know, this sort of a Mandelbrot kind of thing, right? So that you always have most of the chip for the new stuff, but you keep the legacy. Uh, behind. No, you got to worry about legacy. In fact, you know, that's why Motorola was out of business and uh, Intel's still going. 68,000 was better than x86. Right. Now, you can blame it all on the IBM PC when you, when you guys blew that one, you know, uh, by insisting that, you know, you wouldn't do a micro 370 or something. You can say that if you want. I would argue that it's that 
Intel never took their eye off the ball. They always paid attention to the legacy code, and Motorola said, hey, 68,000 is dead. We're going to go risk 88,000. A lot of customers then uh, abandoned uh, the Motorola uh, chip, you know, for somebody else. If you're going to go from 68,000 to, to 88,000, maybe you want to go from 68,000 to something else, you know. You can rethink the whole problem, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you have to deal with legacy code. Uh, but does that mean that you need to be bogged down with the legacy code, or do you devote part of the chip to that? That might be one of my uh, refrigerators, the handling of the legacy code. Uh, are applications different at massive integration scale? And once again, I, make, I kept hammering this point to these guys, because they really had this mindset that massive integration absolutely means massive replication. And second, some of the applications are old, and some were going to come from the dreamers. You know, one of the things about, well, people say computer architecture is dead, and I say no. As long as we get more and more stuff at the transistor level, and there are dreamers that come up with more and more applications, we're always going to be alive and have work to do. The dreamers are not us. The dreamers are these people out there who come up with new applications which are enabled by so much more uh, capability on the chip. <laughs> And then power, uh, very important, but what's critical is the ability to turn it off. I guess that's not a solved problem. So you don't, uh, so what the compiler has to do is say, power up the refrigerator. You don't do that in one cycle. Otherwise, the chip kind of warps, you know. <laughs> but you can do it a few cycles ahead and then step through. And in fact, some of these chips today are already, you know, stepping through different uh, uh, scaling. Uh, well, how about powering off and on? Can we automate the sequential code to parallel? So if we think sequentially, you know, have some piece of software take that sequential and automatically make it parallel. And I think that's important, but I don't think you want to hold your breath. <laughs> Does hardware drive architecture? So I said everything should drive everything else, which is central to my comments today. Optical, uh, ooh, ha, and I can't play my secretary anymore because I did this myself. Uh, op, that was supposed to say optical interconnect. And uh, on chip it would be nice, and off chip it would be nice. Uh, three dimensional, absolutely. Uh, you get the, for the same volume, you're better off with the cube root than the square root. Reconfigurability. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, these ideas that uh, somehow magic, you know, and, uh, a reconfigurability is going to be the answer because uh, it used to be a multiplier and now it's a database processor or something or other. Uh, and so I say be careful. It's not this panacea. Uh, synchronous, asynchronous. So I think that this, so these asynchronous people are claiming that they're going to have a computer that runs completely asynchronously. And maybe so. Uh, I don't see it. Uh, I do think that we're going to see more and more, and you could, you could say that, well, we just have multiple clocks on the chip, but, or you could say that a piece of logic runs asynchronously for some number of cycles and then uh, syncs up, and I think that's part of the future. So, yes, it can run for multiple cycles. But that's like going back to ENIAC, right, because that was before finite state machines, right, so they had a lot of different control signals that that uh, <clears throat> move things in various ways, but it, but it wasn't a notion of a, of a more or a million machine. So they didn't have, so I didn't know that. that yeah. They did not have the notion of finite state machines no. during EDIAC? No. Everything was done asynchronously, is that right? Uh -huh. huh. Well, not, not async, but in the sense that there were there was no clock? dozens of control signals that were generated sure. from a central clock, and it wasn't that the whole machine would change state on cycle boundaries. Was, is that right? There was a lot of things going on at the same time, yeah. And they actually got it to work. But you still have to have a synchronization at multiple points, otherwise it just doesn't work. But you know that. Well, uh, so you know, I wish you were in the meeting. We do, so we, <laughs> you and me know that. But trust me, there are a lot of people out there that are selling, you know, snake oil. That I've, gonna, been, I've been here, I'm, I'm working for IBM. 49 years, since the day I came here, people have been talking about asynchronous structures. It's going to be all asynchronous. It still hasn't happened. 49 years you've been working here. 
So you, I assume you're going to work another 49 years. Do you think after that, after that, you think they'll still be doing that, what? I actually worked for you guys, you know. I was a summer student. I was a, I guess now they call them summer intern. Yeah. You knew that, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, up in Poughkeepsie. And I don't want to, I don't want to tell you what year because some of you weren't born yet. But uh, what were we working on? So my thesis, you know, my thesis was. So we were doing switching theory in those days. And I came up with this uh, primitive that was a lot more complicated than NAND gates. And, uh, but I could never get people to use it. In fact, Jerry Maley, uh, Jerry Maley yeah, he said the way he got people to use NAND gates was he said, well, just do your logic with ands and an or. And then after it's done, just erase all the ands and ors and put NAND and NAND. And trust me, it'll work. You know? <laughs> That's how Jerry Maley got it. So when people saw my stuff and they said, you've got to get out of Yorktown and meet this guy. Because he agrees with you, and in fact, uh, so his name was what? You've been here 49 years? Complex primitive to do, depending on how you bias the inputs, you can do one of many different uh, functions, logic functions. Not Jim Palmer. No, no. Carnot. Carnot. Carnot worked for you guys. Yes. Yeah. Everybody worked for you guys. <laughs> yeah, Carnot maps are dead, by the way. Yeah. With these frequencies, we're going to be using Smith charts to design the uh, logic. So who was the guy? You mean A.J. Smith? Or? Uh, no. just, uh, <laughs> who was the guy? Now, there's a legend. Brad Dunham. Brad Dunham, yeah, I know Brad yeah. Dunham. Yeah, see? Yeah, he was working on that thing, you know? I went into his office. I made the mistake of putting my elbow on his table, and three years of the New York Times uh, <laughs> slid to the floor, if you remember. Yeah. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, and I think 49 years from now, when you get to be an old man and still work for IBM, they'll still be talking about it. But so it's getting ahead of steam these days. Asynchronous design. <laughs> uh, what do things can we do with TerraChip? Let the dreamers tell us again. Uh, I have a big faith in if we provide the enablement, that people will come up with uh, with uses. And finally. Uh, they wanted to know about metrics for designing whether we have effectively used these enormous number of transistors on a chip. And so my answer to that was, uh, yeah, here are the metrics to determine whether uh, we've used effectively the transistors on the chip. And I'm a big fan of not using utilization, say. Uh, you know, VLI, so the VLIW stuff, they say, well, you know, you can generate all this extra work and look at all the extra instructions it's executing. It's not contributing. And so uh, that's all that I have. And look at that. I did this in an hour, 18 slides. So that you can thank PowerPoint. <laughs> when, when, but the trouble was, the word very, see, no, PowerPoint's a disaster. Very too few interruptions. <laughs> Ravi, tear me apart. Go ahead. <laughs> Education has two sides, students and teachers. We have the teachers. So that's a real problem. Which one was that? So he says that education requires two sets of people, not only students, but teachers. And in fact, so I insist that's our biggest problem is that in the freshman course, so I'm, you know about my freshman course, right, this bottom-up approach. And anybody that gets it and does it, they love it. And the kids love it, and everybody learns. But still, and in fact, the, the, the freshman book, there's about 100 adoptions now. But there's over 1,000 non-adoptions. Why? Because there's too many people don't get it, and they walk in there, and they do their lectures, and they don't have a clue what they're doing. But they've memorized these patterns, and the kids memorize it. Ah. What's the most important math course that you ever took? Euclidean. So, yeah, you were one with a big mouth. First so. grade, adding and subtracting. You think so? Euclidean geometry. Yeah, yeah. Have I told you this one before? No. Oh, yeah, geometry, absolutely. Absolutely, plain geometry. Yeah. So, what, of course, Phil would know because Phil's smart. He's more advanced than that. No, no, Phil gets it, you know. I mean, that's what's <laughs> always a pleasure with Phil. He does get it, you know. Plain geometry, absolutely, right? So I'm home for the weekend, and uh, my sister, my kid sister comes up to me, and my kid sister had two big brothers, me and my younger brother, so she was not math challenged. And she shows me this paper, and it's her exam in plane geometry, 10th grade. I don't know about your school systems, but back in Massachusetts, that's when they take it. 
She shows me this, this exam, and she says, I've gone over this proof a hundred times, and I cannot figure out what I did wrong. So I looked through the proof, and she didn't do anything wrong. You know? So I wrote a note in the margin, Mr. Chiffella, who was her math teacher, and I knew him because I had, he was a teacher when I was, and we went to the same high school, me and my kid sister. And in high school, I knew more math than Mr. Chiffella did. <laughs> so I said, there's nothing wrong with this proof. It deserves perfect credit. And the good news is he gave her perfect credit. And then all of a sudden, it hit me what the problem was. See, the problem was that what Mr. Chiffello would do is the night before, this is before PowerPoint, I'm sure he does it differently now if he's still doing it. The night before, he would look in the book and he would copy down the proof. And then he'd go into class and he'd put the proof on the board. And the kids would copy down the proof. You know, from the notes of the professor to the notes of the student without going through the brains of either. You know? <laughs> and then the night before the exam, they'd memorize the proofs. And then they'd come in a class to the exam, and he'd say, prove blah, 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 which he had already put on the board. And they'd write it down, and they'd get 100. The problem with my sister was, she had two big brothers. So she never memorized anything. She'd walk into the exam and say, okay, what do I got to prove here? And then she'd go ahead and prove it. Except that he didn't know enough plain geometry to be able to follow her proof. So, Rabbi, you're absolutely right, you know, that you've got to have teachers that get it. Too many don't. But... You got, this is Yorktown Heights, and you say, uh, so you know, I was told that, you know, the people here don't care about education. You've got to care about education. You're hiring people. Bill Gates, Bill Gates claim, uh, uh, complains that the students they interviewed for jobs at Microsoft don't get it. And finding somebody who understands is a real problem for them. I've got to believe it's a real problem for you guys, you know. So you've got you've to influence what goes on in the classroom. Yeah. And it's about teachers and it's about students, both. And you're absolutely right that teachers, if you don't have, I believe that's why we're still doing it badly, because there aren't enough teachers who really uh, get it. But I think you guys can make a difference. And I think it, so I, I think the reason why I decided to do this talk here, so there's two parts of the talk. One is break through the layers. And that's clearly the message is I, we get the 10 billion transits, et cetera. The other is you need people who understand the layers, and that's an education problem. And you guys can be influential in that, and I just hope you will. Uh, so, yeah, so that's the, well, you're, you know, you're absolutely right. But Ravi, so did you, you know, know Ravi's the one who figured out there was a tragic flaw in my two-level branch predictor. I was looking at which way the branches went. Ravi decided you really need to go through the path. And, of course, he did that, and, you know, better performance. Robert. So you, you debunked successfully um, reconfigurability, and then you gave us the refrigerator story. How many different kinds of refrigerators do you anticipate? Do you anticipate a plethora of hundreds? Absolutely. Or? Absolutely. Why? What? Why? You, you can't say reconfigurability is bad, which is, a, which is mul multiple refrigerators, and then say, ref uh, I'm going to have hundreds of refrigerators, unless you just want more jobs for architects to no, design more no, refrigerators. No, no, no. So there's a fundamental difference between recon... So... <clears throat> what you're saying is, at a high level of abstraction, there is no difference between a piece of reconfigurable logic and multiple hardwired things. Yes. And at this level of abstraction, you're absolutely right. However, if you do it this way, then you can tune each one of these pieces and they can run like a battle to hell. If you do it reconfigurable, now you've got these muxes and bigger area and lower performance and all that stuff. But how do you get to them? And then the refrigerator how do you, how do you not get run to like a pet out of hell? Uh, let's be clear, the refrigerator did not run like a pet out of hell. It <laughs> 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 uh, was actually pretty fast. And, uh, and, yeah, he did. That's correct. So, in fact, when they measure these football players, they don't measure them on the mile. They measure them on the 40 yards, right? Yes, 40 In the yards. case of the refrigerator, they measure them on the one foot. Right? <laughs> and so when you're talking about speed, right, <laughs> it's distance over time. And if the distance varies, then the time can... So for the one foot that he did, he ran like a bat out of hell. So you, but, don't, you don't see a parallel between... No, I don't. And the reason is because... Moving it out yonder to the bus and moving it back is not the same as reconfiguring? So I... Uh, no, because you're moving it to the bus once, and now you whip through all this stuff and then move it back, as opposed to the reconfigurable logic, you've got all these muxes, more power, less performance, uh, greater area, etc., each step of the way. 
Plus, you got to load up the rec you got to load up the configuration bits before you can go also. Right? So yeah, I don't see it as the same thing. Now, the critical point that you, you raise is, you said, how many of these do I believe I'm going to have on the chip? You said, do you believe in hundreds? And I say, yeah. If I've got 10 billion transistors on a chip, I've got room for hundreds. But Remember, the floating point unit was a fraction of one million. But do I have hundreds of types? I need one floating point unit. You know, nobody would redefine floating point precision. So, for example, when the risk kick-up first happened, uh, you know, the Berkeley risk chip and the Stanford MIPS chip, how many data types did they have? Integer. You want to do floating point? Fine. Extract the fraction. No, first extract the exponents. You want to add two numbers together? Extract the exponents. Now figure out where to, how much you have to shift right the fraction that needs to be shifted right. Now you do the add. Now you normalize. And it takes multiple instructions to be able to do a single floating point add. That was a risk idea. Not John Clark. Risk that everybody you know, knows about, right? Multiple instructions to do a 40-point app, okay? Because nobody would ever put a 40-point unit on a chip. No. Today, fortunately, we got that one figured out, right? Uh, what I'm suggesting is that if we adopt this approach, and the algorithms people talk to the microarchitects, the algorithms people can say, hey, we really need this thing, and we really need this thing. And sure, we'll end up with, you know, one of the arguments they gave against the VAX was they said, I don't know how many of you know about the VAX architecture, but it, the ISA started out with 244 opcodes. One of them was edit PC. What edit PC did is it took a, a, uh, uh, a um, <coughs> you've got a uh, ASCII code, a string of ASCII codes. Suppose you get your telephone bill in the mail and it said, you owe the phone company uh, 12345. One, two, three, four, five. What the hell does that mean? How about if it said you owe the telephone company dollar sign one, two, three, decimal point four, five? That's $123.45. You know how much to write the check for. So what you store in the machine is one, two, three, four, five, and before you print the bill, you format that properly. And COBOL has a construct called picture. And the VAX had a construct called edit PC, which is a one-on-one -on -one mapping. And what the risk nuts did is they said, look at all this Fortran code that the Fortran compiler compiles into object code. I've never seen the Fortran compiler generate edit PC. Yeah, but the COBOL compiler did, see? And the point there is that this opcode was in the VAX not for the Fortran compiler, but for the COBOL compiler. There was another instruction. It was called the index instruction, which... Uh, took a subscript of a subscripted array, did bounds checking both ways, and then it did a partial piece of the computation. So if you had the, the high-level instruction that said, a, uh, let's say, uh, a sub i, j, k equals 5. Take the value 5 and move it into this, this entry in the array. Well, the move the 5, that's trivial. But where the 5 is supposed to go, that's not trivial. And so if you look at code that doesn't have an index instruction, it's like 30 or 40 instructions. But if you've got the index instruction, it's index i, index j, index k, move the value 5, four instructions. The COBOL compiler doesn't use that, but the Fortran compiler certainly did. So the point there is that you can, if the algorithm people talk to the microarchitects, yeah, it may be hundreds, and most of them are powered off. If they're not powered off, I lose. <laughs> I mean, no question. Leakage current, we're already there, you know. But if you can power them off when you don't need them, then why not? They just sit there. Where do we get the resources to design them? I mean, today we've settled with the suboptimal use of the hardware because we don't have enough design resources. So you train new designers, I guess. I mean, I don't know. Uh, if you care about... So you have a choice. You can either do this, or you can do terascale integration, which means terascale replication. And then you have... Uh, you know, uh, thousands of cores is what Justin Ratner, this big deal for Intel, says. And most of them will uh, sit there doing nothing, you know. But you have a chip and you'll consume all the transistors. Dave Patterson so. gave a talk here recently. He really? To... Shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> he gave a talk and he just, he defined 13 fundamental primitives that vaguely sound 
a little bit like what you're talking no. about. <laughs> no, no, no. They, his, his idea was to design a whole core as this primitive. So he had 13 primitive. Yeah, he calls them the dwarfs. That's it, right. I could the name dwarfs, them. right. So you're familiar I don't want to, I, yeah, I, I certainly don't want to pick on Dave Patterson. I mean, Dave, no, no, I just was he's a giant in our field, as everybody knows, you know, and I would <laughs> certainly never criticize Dave. Well, anyway. But when I look at the dwarfs, Plus I'm reminded. Plus you two were tight. Too. I'm sorry? Plus you two were, uh, Goombas, right? <laughs> <laughs> How do you know about Goombas? <laughs> you don't look like a Phil thought you. Or a Fiji. So I stay there. Fiji knows what you know about Goombas? <laughs> you know, by the way, I grew up in the neighborhood. You know, I grew up in uh, You know, but that's a whole different story. You know, uh, I talk about my the Italian neighborhood. I was the only non Italian kid in the. The only thing didn't carry a catechism book you know, at that age. I stayed at the Holiday Inn last night. And so, uh, in fact, Carlos and I want to go. Carlos, uh, who Carlos is one of Mateo's students, and he's here as an intern uh, working, uh, uh, working with Pradeep. And so uh, we went off. Uh, Carlos picked me up at the airport, and we went out for coffee. See, I, I'm worried about this IBM uh, budget thing that I said. You know, that Carlos picked me up, saved me the, you know, the rental car or whatever. And... Uh, we want to get some good coffee, and Carlos knows good coffee. I mean, Carlos is a student at Barcelona, and he, he comes from Brazil, you know, and he, you know, he's been to France and other places. You've been to Italy too, I hope. You never been to Italy? Yeah, sure. Well, of course. We you have, <laughs> we really have good coffee. We have coffee in Italy. Yeah. Last <laughs> night? No, in Italy. You and I. That's right. Exactly. That's right. That's what we we did. Oh, where the coffee is really good. So. I put my stuff away, then I, there's two women at the desk, and I say, oh, where do you get good coffee in this town, this Mount Kisco? And the two women said, you know, we, the two of us, we disagree on where the good coffee is in Mount Kisco. Mm -hmm. uh, she insists that Starbucks, and I don't like the Starbucks coffee. She says, uh, I think that Dunkin' Donuts is much better. So those are the two coffee joints. <laughs> so we found a place called Cosi, which uh, the espresso wasn't ha uh, half, it was not half bad, right? So Goomba. So, oh, you digressing on me. Yeah. 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 So, 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 so you know, Professor Patterson has, you know, I mean, he's written this textbook with Hennessy that's used and that, what. Is, is anyway, no, 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 let me finish. Let me, what? Any relationship Dave, uh, between yeah, what I, I think and what he thinks? Well, the, like the dwarfs, do you want to do things like that? But you no, have no, no. So the dwarfs, I guess, do it. You know, if we go high enough up, you know, for fifty thousand feet, all men are equal. You know, except once you get down closer, you see you know, some are black. You know, some are Muslim. You know, don't touch that. Yeah. You see what Ian Coulter says? He says it's incredible. This is my country. The country I was born in. Look what they're doing. To Different, can't digress it. Uh, so at some high level, maybe yes. Uh, I think that the dwarfs thing has more thinking that they have to do. In fact, I am reminded when I look at the dwarfs of the Livermore Loops. And uh, uh, it's so maybe if, maybe to say it this way. Yes, Dave and I agree that we have to pick out pieces of stuff. To, to, to special case, but I'm looking at the whole machine, and I don't care what your application is, it's more than just this. In the same way that the Livermore Loop, you know, the Livermore Loop, well, you know, you, you have to go to memory, and you have to have branches, and you have to have all this stuff that is not part of this thing that runs like, uh, like, a, like a bat out of hell. There was this, uh, I'm not sure what the reason was, but it, it, um, up near Newburgh, I remember there was this super highway from nowhere to nowhere, the, about 10 miles worth or something or other. Is it still there? It was like, a, you don't know about this? There was this interstate that went for about 10 miles, and so it would take you two years to get to the interstate, and then boom, you could go through this fast, and two years to get back onto the, the uh, regular road, and somehow that was a win, which I could... Never, never figure. Yeah, and you know what the bandwidth is, right? It's, it's so uh, I think there's more. So uh, I think they have to do. They have to consider a larger scope. But to a first approximation, yeah, a special piece of logic to handle a special thing. Ah. 
the dwarfs come from having people talk about pieces of code, I think, as opposed to what I want is the function units come from algorithms, people saying, if you will put this piece of stuff, I can write my algorithms to make better use of that piece of stuff. Just now, I see that as fundamentally different. But just lower level? Well, you had a point that the applications drive the architecture, and so if there's a marriage between yeah, the architecture and, and application, I think that you could. That's right, but it's apple. Yeah, so it's application. You know, actually, it's at a, a higher level in some sense. It's the person doing the algorithm that says, "Hey, this is what I need." Right. So maybe at one level, maybe Dave and I are on the same page, which would be nice. Might, you know, I think if they had, if they would say there's ten thousand dwarfs, you would be on the same page. Yeah, I think your your idea is really multiple finer parts of his dwarfs. You know, maybe, maybe more pieces, which seems more reasonable. I can't believe they're thirteen. There's no way. No, no, oh, that's not seven. what he's saying. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> thirteen doesn't seem. No, no, no. So we're both mate. We we both uh, kind of hypothesize, and he knows. I think I do. The Berkeley Parallel Lab. They're interested in looking at find the applications which can be enabled for laptops and portables by many core. And so they came up with these 13 dwarfs as, as al uh, applications that had the characteristics that they think will be found that they can use in these portable mobile devices. The thing is totally focused on client portable laptop -y types of things. And so you can't optimize every single algorithm in the world, so they pick 13 representative dwarfs. Now, whether they're the right ones or not, you could argue. Yeah, so, so I don't want to optimize, so I don't want to take 13 or even 1,000 applications and optimize. What I want to do is have the algorithms people tell me what they would like to see on the chip that will allow them to write better algorithms. Right, and the they want to they want to say, okay, we have these thirteen things, and we really want to enable new ways of doing things. You know, for laptops or portable devices, they're going to have these characteristics. So, what do we design, and how do we write the software? And but things but like the that. funny thing is, two years ago it was seven, which was why. So I actually thought seven. Yeah, seven. Yeah, that's what I thought. Three. But he said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe they'll get up to a thousand if you go with that. That was the baker's dozen. Right. <laughs> the baker's yeah. Dozen. yeah, so we can't call it dwarves anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So it goes up like ah, that's why it was dwarfs. Cause, yeah, right. so, and yeah, Patterson right. is a mass. So you've heard him talk. I mean, this guy is good at getting people to, you know, to <laughs> sign on. Oh, yeah. No, he's absolutely a master. But like 13 and, dwarves doesn't resonate. Yeah, right. Yeah, so he's got to come up with... Thirteen donuts or something or other, right? A <laughs> uh, baker's dozen. I'll bet. I'll bet. So if they stay with thirteen for any length of time, I'll bet it's a baker's dozen. Absolutely. Except that, you know, it'll, it will be, you know, twenty next week, and uh, yeah. maybe I don't know. But yeah, so it's a very different uh, granularity and focus, etc. Anything else? More questions? Thank you very much.